Hi, everybody. My name is Germán Fernández. Uh, I'm the president and CEO of ISAN, International School of uh, Agri, um, Agri Management. Um, I have the pleasure to be able to introduce um, this uh, new webinar series that we are doing in ISAN. Um, the, the one that we are doing today is going to be uh, presented by Flavio Alzueta. Um, I'm going to introduce you uh, Flavio Alzueta. He has over 20 years of experience in the global Agri supply chain sector. Um, he has uh, been in around 80 countries uh, that he has visited due to work or work relationships. Um, the most relevant uh, about his work experience is being for the past year, he's been the VP and CMO of Global Gap, which you probably all know. Um, so that has given him like the exposure and the overview of, of about how the whole uh, agricultural supply chain uh, work, works. Um, in terms of like his educational background, he has a degree in international business and law from Buenos Aires University in Argentina, an MBA from Instituto de Empresa from IE Business School, uh, with also uh, part of the program was in SAFES in, Ch in Shanghai. Uh, he's got executive education um, uh, courses from Wharton and from Harvard University, he has done the agribusiness program um, and also recently, he did the program Creating Shared Value with Michael Porter, uh, which is also quite relevant. Um, he is going to present a whole oval, uh, overview of the global supply chain. And in terms of ISAM, he's also the co-founder uh, of uh, ISAM and the chairman of the advisory board. Plus, he also teaches both in the Master International Agronegocios, uh, the program that we started last year uh, in Spanish for professionals, and we will be also be teaching in the Master International Agribusiness Management that starts uh, this coming uh, October 2020. So uh, after making the presentation, I also wanted to give you, you know, some tips about how the webinar is going to be working. Uh, first, uh, Flavio will be doing uh, a presentation. At the same time as he's doing the presentation, you will be able to type questions, but those questions are going to be only asked at the end of the webinar. So we will collect all those questions, and at the end, uh, we will be able to read those questions, and if somebody wishes to do it live uh, by talking to Flavio, uh, they can let us know, and we will let that person also uh, speak. So, um, I think that's all uh, right now. So I'm going to pass on uh, to, Fa to Flavio. Thank you. OK. Thank you, Herman. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, everybody who is registered to this webinar. And thank you to the ISAM team for arranging this. It seems it's very successful due to the number of people who's uh, registered. I think there are more than 100 people registered for this webinar. This is great that you know every crisis has some opportunities. And due to the COVID, I think all of these webinars are kind of blooming globally. But this is a way for everybody just to get knowledge from different topics, just being uh, at home. No, that means it's, it's great. Thank you, Herman. Due to the introduction, maybe it was a, a little long for the people who was listening, but I think it's interesting. What Herman and the team asked me, based on the knowledge that they have about my my experience, is just to prepare a kind of overview about what we are seeing, uh, mainly what I am seeing uh, 
around the world. No, I have fortunately a, a kind of 360 vision because I, I talk to uh, the, the food industry buyers, I talk with the producers and big, ex, big exports or exporters, and also I have a big team of people in different parts of the world that really bring knowledge well, about what happened specifically on markets. No, uh, let me before continue just a, a disclaimer. Everything what I am going to share with you, uh, I am the, the responsible. I am not talking on behalf of Global Gap, on behalf of any member of the organization. This is a content that I collect based on my talks and some research, some reports. And I hope that you find this uh, interesting. I try to accelerate a little the, the slides in order to give you more time for some questions. Maybe I don't have all the answers, but we can try to build together uh, this, the answers or what could be the, the potential solution for some things. This is part of the role as an organization like ISAM, no? just to de develop leaders who will have all the skills and the tools to be able to solve uh, problems that everybody is facing. As the title says, we are looking for identify how the, the, the population could be really impacted by the COVID and especially from the viewpoint of the food security or insecurity. And this is one of the also one of the sustainable development goals that maybe you are familiar with. But it's important also to highlight because we want even to create, create some kind of awareness during, with this kind of webinar. Let me first, please, just to uh, build a kind of frame. My idea is just to give a frame of the global situation. Also go by sectors, maybe livestock, uh, crops, uh, and fisheries and aquaculture, maybe some subsectors, just to have some highlights. Um, and also at the end have some conclusions. And secondly, or ultimately, we will have you now this uh, phase four questions. Just something starting, starting point and really relevant for everybody to be aware. Because for years, it seems like the agricultural sector is not really fancy at all. It's not, not glamorous. And people, my own experience when I, I did my MBA 15 years ago, most of the people wanted to move to the finance, to the banking sector, or even to the consultancy firm, what is quite good, of course. But at that time, I was working in the agricultural sector, and always I thought that this is an industry that always will be needed, and this industry also needs leaders. And I wanted at that, at that time just to create some kind of positive impact in the sector. No? This is why relevant to know, FAO has estimated that 60% of the global population is connected somehow with the agricultural sector. Here we have all the spectrum. We have the smallholders that really are growing food for surviving. And also we have the big producers and exporters that they have 30,000 hectares of apples in South Africa or in Belgium, or you know 100,000 hectares of soybean in Argentina and Brazil. That means we are talking about everybody when we talk about this 60%. COVID for all of us is something new. It's a kind of, you know, something is hitting our heads and we have to start to reveal new processes to adapt. But this kind of pandemics are not new for the, for the humankind. No? It's something that we have been faced for years or for centuries. The latest one, I was checking basically the famous Spanish flu at the beginning of the 20th century, it killed over 50 million people. That means it's something that was huge and people needed to adapt it to this situation. In the 50s, we had the Asian flu with another 1 million people uh, who died. But also in the 80s, we had the HIV, you know, the AIDS, and the calculations is about uh, 32 million people died to this kind of infection. That means the humans always had faced this kind of issues. This is why we need just to learn what happened in the past and try to, to improve the, every system. And in our case, especially the food system, because here, you know, we are talking about food. This is the basic for us to sustain our life on earth. And secondly, we can discuss about the economy, but first we need to sustain us in on the planet. No? And this is why the, the important for everybody to understand the relevant points and what is really affected due to the to the COVID. Uh, having said that, 
the impact of COVID on the food and agricultural sector has different really levels of impact. One of them that I will go even in detail a little later is in my particular case, after having talked to, I don't know, company from different I don't know, 20 countries, something like that, this is what I did in the last three or four weeks. And I talked even with a retailer from different parts of the world. Really, I, I arrived to the conclusion that the consumer is behaving very, very similar. Doesn't matter where he is based. No? People in Myanmar or people in Germany or in Spain uh, behaved in the similar you know, patterns. For instance, when the pandemic started, everybody wanted to buy huge amount of products and even focus on frozen foods. When the situation started to, to change, people start to decide to, more, to buy more fresh products instead of frozen. People are thinking to buy healthy food. That means the consumer behavior was changing, but there are some commonalities, commonalities around the world. That means the humans have something in, in our minds that is the, fima, the famous uh, Maslow pyramid, no? pyramid that always we need to, to, to survive. And when we need to survive, everybody has the same, the same behaviors. No? But of course, the supply chain was affected due to this. No? The some home confinement in many countries. I am based in Spain. In Spain, we, we have been allowed to allow to, to go outside for more than 60 days. And now we are starting with some kind of relaxation. This, of course, will happen here, but in another country also impact a lot in some sectors, especially restaurant food services, the cash and carry sector, you know, these big uh, supermarkets focusing cash and carry in which the customer is mainly the restaurant, the food service, also they are facing really bad situations. That means this is affecting different different sectors in the supply chain. Now I'm going to go, to go specifically to, for instance, the, the fisheries and aquaculture. Because when I well, decided, when we decided to found to, to found a ISAM, especially based on the ideas of Herman, something what I, I said to the team is we need to focus in the agricultural sector, but in a very broader sense. That means we have to focus on crops, especially if you want fruit and veg, grains and flowers, because there are very important subsectors. And in some countries, for instance, the flower production in Kenya or in Ethiopia is something basic for very small producers. Or the same when you talk about producing canola in Kenya or in other countries in, in Africa. That means we, in crops, we want to focus in, in these three subsectors, but when we talk about fisheries, we also talk about aquaculture. Why? Because aquaculture is becoming very important for the survival of the, the population all around the world. As you maybe uh, you've seen in, the, in this slide, different uh, continents have been affected due to this uh, reduce of freedom of movement. No people wasn't able really, or weren't able to go to fish. That means the one who were able, because in some countries they have some kind of license to go, when they return, they didn't find any customers, especially due to the restaurants and food services sector is closed. That means they invested time, invested money, but when they come back, they have to throw away the product. That means they are not getting anything in return. That means this group of workers are reducing the incomes, then they don't have enough money to buy extra foods. This is how you can see the, the whole impact. No? Because sometimes we talk, you know, a high level is okay, so it's affecting the fisheries. But when you start to trace back who is really affecting, you realize that the worker who is on, on, the, on the ship, on the vessel, is really affecting because he's reducing. And this is, has an, an impact in another sector. No? For instance, in the, in the supermarket chains, the non-food sector was totally a, a disaster during the, the COVID, no? Because people focus in food basically all, all the time, no? uh, In aquaculture, there is a growing evidence that the unsold produce will result in an increase of live fish stock. But what happened there? When you are producing uh, aquaculture, and I have the opportunity to visit different countries and visit aquaculture productions, you know, in, 
in Indonesia, in, in Vietnam, I remember in Thailand, when you just talk with the producers, what is the highest cost that they have normally is feed. They need to invest a lot of money to feed the fish. But they have another issue, the in mortality rate. That means they have to find the right balance in order just to have the fishes there, but sell in the right time to avoid extra cost. But if you have the fish, like in this case, you don't have a market, you have to maintain the fish more time, the rate of mortality is increased. That means at the end, the whole production could be affected for some disease. And disease comes from this the density in the production cage. Again, maybe it's a very detailed, but it's for you to, to know how we want to create the, the awareness on exactly what happened in every sector of the, the supply chain. I think this is one of the, the game changers of ISAM as a business school focus in agriculture. No? We are going very well, very, very well, yes, in, in details or very details in what happened in every sector in order to identify with, which are the, the problems and just to create solutions. There are many, I, I will not go in detail more in these cases, but I saw one example with artificial intelligence, how with a very simple sensor, the producer was able to identify how much hunger each fish has in order to know if he has to feed more or less. Because sometimes when you are feed, feeding more than the fish needs, there is a lot of residues on the bottom of the of the cage. That means many topics. And I think this is one of the, the relevant advantage from, from ISA, no? the, the view that we have to bring a very detailed approach of every subsector. Livestock in general, and dairy in particular, and I use I, I use this picture because I also think what I saw when I visited in different opportunities countries in Africa. When we think about dairy, of course, we think about Danone, maybe, you know, this is a very famous organization. But again, we have a huge spectrum of people who lives from this sector, from the dairy sector. And in Africa, and especially in the dairy sector, women are the ones who are not leading these, these farms. And sometimes when they don't have resources enough, they don't have the knowledge to know when some uh, behavior could be against uh, the, the health of, the, of their own family members. For instance, uh, once I knew that when women were milking the goats, they didn't have the right knowledge just to know that they have to wash the hands before feeding their kids. No, Sometimes these, these women, without knowing this, after milking, immediately feed their, their kids with the food. And sometimes they, they were a kind of uh, transfer, some kind of diseases due to these kind of things. That means dairy plays an amazing role Generally speaking, a small farmers played an amazing role in Asia and in Africa, and we have to, to keep in, into account these kind of, of things. No? Again, COVID is affecting the sector because the, there is not a opportunity to sell the product. That means the producers have to dump the product because there is not a customer to, to buy this. I was checking, I didn't want to include this, just to avoid numbers and numbers, but in US, the, the the financial hole is huge because every day they have to throw away liters and liters and liters of, of the. Uh, one of the things that uh, COVID is creating, or the main obstacle that in this sector is, is creating, is that in many countries there is not a, a license to operate. That means producers don't have the freedom to take their you know trucks just to bring the, the milk to another place because exactly is, everything is, is closed. No? This is one of the, of the things in, in data that what I wanted to, to highlight. And the other thing is you not know, this kind of reducing the efficiency because there is not a way to feed the animals. When you are not able to move to another province, there are many producers who live in some place and the next province is only 30 kilometers from his home. But due to these limitations and constraints to move, he's not able to move to feed the animals. And the animals could die, 
That means there are other consequences that are affecting all, all the time. It, let me, I have one, one survey that I want to, it's a quick one just to have a kind of, you know, interaction between you and myself. Uh, please read this. I don't know if you read, see everything. This is some numbers where I took from FAO, you know, in 2016, the total world fisheries aquaculture, uh, the total, maybe uh, I, there's a lack of word in there. The idea is the total production, if you sum up fisheries and aquaculture, was 170 million tons. How much represent, from your viewpoint, the aquaculture? I want you to, to have a kind of a clearer idea what is the role of the aquaculture currently and how this is moving towards in, in, the, next, in the next years. I will give you another minute because I think it's, it's interesting. And this is part of our role to create awareness about this agricultural sector and especially sectors that most of the time people are, don't know. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's moving. Now I am I'm happy that we did this, this survey because it's, it's clearly there are, there are different perceptions about the, the, the relevancy of the aquaculture sector. Okay, more than fifty more than fifty percent of the people already already voted. Okay, another thirty seconds for the ones who who wants to do it that didn't do it yet. Okay, let's. Let's close the, the poll just to continue moving on this. I don't know if you are seeing the, the results. Really, the, the right the right number is 47% based on the number from 2016. 50% uh, I put really close. But this is what the, the current production of aquaculture. That means we are eating a lot of aquaculture products, mainly salmon, tilapia, pangasius. This is what you know, uh, shrimps. This is the, the most famous. But of course, there are a variety. The variety is, is huge. But 50%. And I'm happy to do this because uh, now you know that how important is aquaculture. And of course, it's a huge business opportunity because you can have aquaculture production with cages in the sea, or you can have this inland. You know, I, I saw in Vietnam ponds, you know, in the middle of a field, they dig a pole, uh, sorry, um, what is it, a pond, and there uh, grew or produce pangasius, what is a variety of fish, very big, is famous. In Europe, was called panga, but it's the variety is called the species is called panga. That means it's a huge business opportunity in the future. No, this is what I wanted to, to share this with, with us. Uh, let's come back to the presentation. Now, okay. if we talk about uh, crops what is going on in, in crops. Uh, based on my conversations in different parts of the world, uh, if I talk about specifically fruit and vegetables, when I talk to the producers, I can tell you Colombia, Mexico, Peru, um, one of the main problems that they had was logistics. Due to this kind of prohibition or bans from people to move, for instance, nobody was imported anything from China. That means you know, they didn't have enough uh, containers just to move the product from, from Latin America to Europe. Same happened to the people from Thailand or Myanmar. Normally they do everything by airplanes or freight air, air cargo, but they didn't have planes to do this. That means they couldn't sell the, the product, you know. Uh, another countries happened here in, in Spain, happened in Germany, 
happened also in, in Netherlands, they suffer a shortage of workers for farm. For instance, in the case of Netherlands, of Germany, normally they are migrant, wor migrant workers and they decided to return to their homes. Normally Poland, Romania, Bulgaria. In the case of Spain, in the south, was different. Normally the workers are uh, migrants, but they are living in Spain. They, they have, you know, this, these homes here. Then they didn't decide to come back. But due to the social distance, instead of having two people, I don't know, per square meter, they had to have only one. That means they needed more people. What they did, they had to train people who used to work in the restaurant sector, on the food service sector, in order to have enough, you know, workers on farm. But even in this case, for instance, the various producers in Spain, is in a province called Huelva, they couldn't uh, bring, normally the, the workers that they, they bring from Morocco, every year they, they bring uh, 20,000 workers, most of them women that they are coming every year for the last 20, in some cases there are people who are coming for the last 20 years, but they couldn't. That means they think that they are going to lose a lot of business. That means there is one of the, the other issues. Logistics, I mentioned, uh, workers, shortage of workers on, on farm happened. I talked to producers in India. In India, the government was very strict, strict in terms of freedom to move. That means they didn't have en enough people for the harvest season. They are also being, being affected by all of this. That means COVID was really uh, affecting the, the supply chain. But on the other hand, the demand was quite good when you talk to the producers and exporters. Some of them could have been affected, especially because some the demand from the restaurants and the food services was reduced, but the sales for fresh food, fruit and vegetables was increased in the, in the retailers or supermarkets. I will mention why in, in the next, when we talk about the conclusions. That means for you to, to remember, no, the main problem is logistics, basically, workers on farm, and the reduction in the demand in some countries in food, uh, food service and restaurant. But fortunately, the, the increase in, uh, from, for fresh uh, vegetables and fruit was, was really great. When we talk about supply chain, we need to talk about food security, or as I, I, I mentioned, between brackets is insecurity, because this is the main issue, you know, when you, you don't have affordable food in a good quality uh, food. This is the, the, the other viewpoint, because sometimes we, we talk or think only in business terms, but the other, another side that there are a huge amount of people that always is suffering due to this hunger issues, but with the COVID is really exacerbating the, the situation. This picture, as I mentioned, is from BBC. This is what happened at the beginning in, of the uh, COVID in UK, for instance. This is what people at the beginning started to be really, really worried and try to buy huge piles of products, no? As I mentioned there, the, the demand of uh, food has been affected due to this reduction of incomes. Many people has lost their, their jobs, and many, because are even working in, in some areas who are connected with the food, also reducing their incomes, then the purchasing power or capacity was also reduced. Already mentioned this kind of commonalities in the consumer's behavior in different latitudes. It's really, for, for me, it was a kind of really learning piece. I thought that maybe this would change, would be different, especially because in some countries, for instance, in India, I think that 95% of the, the, the buyings of fruit and vegetables is uh, doing in the wet markets, you know, the street markets, really the formal uh, retailers or super, supermarket chain in India is really, really small. You know? For years, they try to, you know, to, to make this bigger, but they still struggle with the situation. Means I thought that maybe India could behave different, but no, the, the, the consumers behave very, very similar in every part of the world. And another learning piece is, 
I mentioned regarding with the consumer behavior that at the beginning people bought more or huge quantities and also bought uh, frozen food just to you know accumulate just in case. Now this situation changed and also the consumer is buying or is more focused on vitamin rich products. That means people want to buy healthier food or what they consider healthy healthy food. No, and one change I was talking with one of the largest producer and exporter uh, from Peru, very famous, and they have operations in many countries. And he told me it's not official information, but this is information that he was uh, taking. Meanwhile, you talk with the different supply chain players that the lemons and oranges now are the top one and two product in US, for instance, when in the past always were banana and apples. That means was a change in the mindset of the people, say, okay, of the consumers say, okay, maybe COVID, because it's a virus, it's a kind of flu. And always I have heard that the vitamin C or vitamin C really helps to, you know, to fight against these viruses, I will buy most. That means there is a change. Also kiwis, for instance, due to the content of vitamin C, it was very, very demanding. And what was affected was, uh, it's called the exotic foods, you know, the foods, the dragon foods, on the physalis food that normally are considered exotics and normally are more expensive than the average. This is, our, they are suffering. The you know, producer of those products really are suffering because there, are, there is no demand. But the other products, the demand really, really is steady. And I was talking even this morning with some producers, it's growing all the time, not the demand. Again, we want to create awareness about the importance, and this should be part also of your strategy, of your company's strategy. And what I am teaching in, in ISAM, and I will teach in another business school for next year, is really how to embed the sustainable development agenda and the sustainability in the strategy. This is, shouldn't be something for you to make a difference or to be different in the market. I wrote a, recently an article and invite you to, to connect, connect with me in, in LinkedIn and you can read the article I call sustainability marketing. And basically what I'm saying is sustainability marketing is a license to operate. When you define your marketing mix, always this should be done in this kind of framework defined by the sustainable development agenda. Not only for use the logo, but should be uh, or must be a high level of responsibility for everybody who wants to do something. And really, we shouldn't think in anything or in any kind of business without delivering any positive impact, no? Whatever we, we do or, or whenever we do that. I mean, this is, for me, important to highlight. And in this particular case, when we talk about food and we talk about food or insecurity, food insecurity, um, I like to mention that the goal number two is focus on zero hunger, and this is, is connected with this. I have another another slide, just another survey to, to share with you, but please have in mind that during this situation, everybody somehow is affected, but as always, the most vulnerable people, the poorest, are the ones who are more affected than anybody. That means let's keep this in mind, and when we work in our organizations, try to include this. Yeah, Herman mentioned that <clears throat> I was part of, took part of the, sorry, let, let me take some water. I was in a training with Mr. the famous Professor Michael Porter in Harvard Business School last year. And he has a theory that I really I liked a lot. He said that we can make business solving social issues. And this is what also part of the value of ISAM. We recognize this. We want this to become the core of ISAM for every leader who pass uh, through our facilities really come back to their communities with this in the mindset. Let's make business. Let's make sustainable business in terms of financial operations. But at the same time, let's solve societal so, social issues or societal problems. No, this is one of the the main goals. We talk about. Uh, COVID, how we are affecting globally, but I was reading an article I want you also to, to highlight. I don't know if you are really uh, aware of, of this, 
we have we are receiving very very few news about the situation but there is a locust swarm in in africa especially in the africa horn that is affecting i know 10 or 11 countries that is been a disaster and people i think they are not really caring about covid because this is ever uh, you know more dangerous for for the food security or for the the future of their food than everything I mean, this is another issue, even sometimes in the future for the one who will be part of, of ISAM, some of the master, we, cast, we can discuss how this also could be a kind of business case and what we can do in order to avoid this to happen again or how we can create some solutions now, no? But it's very relevant. But this also affected food insecurity in Africa. But I just read another article from yesterday that there is another locust swarm in India. It's affecting a huge part of India. That means COVID is affected, it's affected the supply chain, it's connected with the food insecurity, but there are another issues. Now, for us, the ones who are working in this agricultural sector and who play a role of uh, responsibility or wants to have a role of responsibility, we have, you know, to feed our, our mindset with all of these issues. Because having this open view, we will be really we will be able just to create solution as I, as I mentioned. Uh, let me just share with you another survey. If I am able to do that. Now we are we all are aware on the role of the sustainable development goals. What I mentioned, the goal number two is zero. Do you know how many people in the world regularly go to, to bed hungry? Again, we want to create awareness. This is part of our role. Sorry for insist on this, no, but I am totally convinced this is the role of an institution as ISAM, you know, to, to, tra to transfer this kind of knowledge. And for the ones who are in this in this call, when you come back to your company, your communities, bring something back and have some, you know, some feed for, for thoughts, how we can solve problems and even how we can make this in a sustainable way. Means to create a business on this in order to solve issues, but at the same time to make money. Because the other way just to do philanthropy and say, okay, you know, for every 100 euros where I sold, I will give five cents for someone, you know, in Africa. It was very common, this. But really, this is not sustainable. This idea just to make business solving issues, I think, is, is very relevant to, to take into account. You have another 30 seconds. Okay, it's very good to see how you are thinking of the, the information what you have okay i am going to go to close the the poll now and share with you the results okay if you see the the right number is 820,000 sorry eight uh, 820 million people who are every day going to bed feeling, you know, hunger in, in their stomachs. That, that means it's a lot of people. Really, maybe you sometimes you have read that we have another 1 million people that suffer obesity, you know, uh, but this is the, the situation. And this number, huge number, uh, is really facing bad situation. This is, I want you also to, to share with you when we talk about. Uh, COVID, when we talk about food insecurity, let's connect this with the sustainable development goals. Let's think how we can solve issues connected with all of this, because we can also create business connected. And in this particular case, the, the, the goal number two, we need to do something. No? And now we are arriving to the conclusions. I'm going to go quickly because we have another 20 minutes for for questions. I hope you, you have some, some questions. Food and agriculture are not outside the impact of the COVID-19, based on what I just said with you. Crop, livestock, and fisheries have been affected by this pandemic. 
the supply chain has been hit hardest by COVID-19, which causes food insecurity of most vulnerable, vulnerable uh, segment of the population at risk. This is what, what I mentioned. Therefore, the government should enforce the measures to control the pandemic without disturbing the food supply chain and considering the food security of their citizens. No? Basically, this is what I want to, to highlight as a conclusion. No? We are affected because we are in, in this industry or we want to be, for the ones who are connected are not currently in the industry, but I assume that you are. Yeah. And we need the government just to give us the, the license to work you know, with some kind of freedom, of course, reducing any kind of, of risk, but we need to continue producing and delivering food all over the world in order to avoid also that the prices could really increase. And if this happened, the number of people who is who are going to bed feeling hunger, this will increase as well. Basically, this is my, my conclusions. Germán, I give you the word to, to you. We have 20 minutes for Q&A. Thank you, Flavio. I think now what we're going to do is we're going to give uh, a couple of minutes uh, for people to reflect uh, on this really interesting topic that Flavio has been talking about. So um, think about the questions. Uh, I'm going to be ordering those questions and then uh, I will pass it on to, to Flavio. If somebody wish you know, to speak up, also let me know uh, in the public chat and I will actually unmute them and allow them to, to speak and to have the conversation also with Flavio. So one way or the other, uh, let's do this. So I'm going to take a little bit of time so you can, you know, put your thoughts together and think about some interesting questions, because I think the most important part about these uh, webinars, uh, it's like, what is the interaction that we're going to have uh, after it? And thank you again, Flavio. I already see some really interesting topics. Really good. OK. I'm going to wait a little bit more. So. All right, so I'm going to start uh, with the first one um, from Sonali uh, Mukherjee. What are some differences among consumers around the world in how they responded to COVID-19? Flavio. First of all, <laughs> all what I explained doesn't mean that they have all the answers, no? because in some, some of them are new, some of them maybe require some analysis and so on, but I try to be honest in my, in my idea. Really, what are the, the some differences among consumers, maybe generally speaking, as, as I mentioned, I saw that very common behaviors, you know, how they, they bought at the beginning, how they, they evolve. Of course, the main difference is between segments, maybe in the same, the same market, the low incomes, you know, uh, segment of the population, they are spending 90% of their incomes in food, you no? Know? This is one of the the main, main difference that we can see within the countries, no one we segment the countries. But in terms of the consumer behavior, this is what I mentioned. I was even I kind of surprised when I was talking to people and everybody told me that the consumers uh, react very, very similar. You know? I hope I answered the other question. Okay, thank you. So the next one, uh, comes from Miguel Jimenez. So, uh, should, there be, should there be a change in the structure of the supply chain, more locally focused, smaller producers? How do you think this will affect food safety and certification bonds? What, what, uh, what I think it clearly will be a, a change in the supply chain, because I am already seeing this. I am seeing that, for instance, I saw last week that in the London area, uh, there are some projects when they are building greenhouses, something that in the past uh, was very expensive and even was against the sustainability because they need to, to heat, you know, the greenhouses. 
but now they are creating a, an amazing facilities and they are having these kind of recycles and so on. And what I read is this uh, project will uh, represent something like the 10% of the consumption of tomatoes of UK. That means that in the past, this 10% was by from, from Spain. That means that Spain producers will see some kind of reduction in the demand of tomato from, from UK. I think that the government, due to the COVID, realized that the supply chain, generally speaking, only food, uh, is a kind of weak, no? because always you need some food from some countries. I think this is why they, they are going to, to redesign the, the supply chain. And I think what you are saying, more locally oriented, could happen. But also, every country is exporting something. That means they have to be very, very cautious in the way how they are limited. But for sure, this will be more, more orientation towards the, the local producing. And how this will this affect food safety? Food safety will be always, you know, top of the mind of everybody. Uh, that means I don't think this will change the certification, but maybe in the future, this is my own viewpoint, maybe the way how we are assessing or checking the farmers will change, no? My viewpoint. Thank you, Miguel. Okay, thank you. So next one, it's going to be from Gustavo Santana. Uh, so so uh, due to this coronavirus pandemic, the act of skipping some steps in the agro-food value chain is increasing in some European countries. For example, producers, industry transformers sell directly to the customer consumer skipping retailers okay so how do you think this change will affect agro food value chain in the future i think also this will will be a change because until or before the covid arrives uh, some segment of the population never were wo willing to to make a you know to buy food by e-commerce you know maybe the young generations they were are also i have read that in the past different reports and always people were willing to buy anything but food because people needed to see the food to touch the food to smell the food but due to this change that everybody was obliged to try to to buy a uh, food and we were obliged to buy uh, by e-commerce i think this will be a change for new players to come i was reading that there are all the time new players but i think will be a different retailer it's not really the, the the farmer is going to be the directly to directly to the to the consumers. Mm -hmm. I really don't see that it's going to happen because you need logistics. Uh, really, if you are a, a consumer, you don't want to you want to make you know thirty different uh, buys to, to to buy from someone else to another producer. If a group of producers, you know, have five different, this is the, the different, the difficult part of this. No, you as a buyer, you want to make only one operation, just to buy everything, and maybe producers can only send one, two, or three products in, in the best cases. This is what I think. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next one comes from Bonolo Umoja. Uh, how can supply chains be made inclusive to ensure food security? Again, my personal view, everything is reducing to one word. Incentives. You need to create incentive. And this is something that the supply chain players, especially the, the buying side, they need to be aware and to incorporate this word to the to their policy. This is maybe sometimes I have some some doubts about that. No? They think that they because they have the power to buy. They don't need to create incentives. And my experience is when you really create an incentive for the farming sector, really they are more will, more than happy to do everything. Mm -hmm. But you need to create incentive. If you just impose things, and when you create incentives, at the end, the food security will be solved, you know, easily. But let's create incentive to include everybody, you know. Thank you. Okay. Bon so next one. From Tony Chavez, what is your point of view in urban in urban farming to to combat food de deserts, nutritional poverty, and the creation of a new local economy opportunity? 
the first view for me is great. Of course, we have to analyze what other impacts we can have. I don't know if there is a in, a, in a desert and there is a kind of limitation of water, maybe we want to create something, but at the end we are affected negatively another another factors. No, this is something just to, to take into account. But of course, urban farming, I think is a, is a trend that is here to, to stay. And I think it's something good because for many people will have access very close to the to the food. I mean, I would say, okay, go ahead, but let's analyze exactly which are the negative effects that in some cases you can bring. Let's balance this, no? But I would say, mm -hmm. go ahead. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Next one from Megan uh, McCarter. Uh, do you send uh, do you send the effect the effect of food security? for the most vulnerable to be more impacting within or between countries? Megan, so, I, yeah. I didn't understand exactly the, the question. The most the most vulnerable, uh, do you send the, I, I think that she said, do you see, no, the-, the Do you see the, maybe, yeah. Effect effect, of, yeah. Mm -hmm. Most vulnerable be more impacting within or it, I really, I, I don't understand exactly this. Maybe, Megan, if you can explain a little more, we continue to the next, and please explain a little more, okay? Okay, all right. So next one is uh, from, all right. Oops, sorry, there's been, Sorry, there is an issue with the. Uh, okay, so now the next one is from Henry. So, due to coronavirus, uh, being an entrepreneur will be something hard, but uh, will Sam provide the students with how to start a project from zero? Okay. I mean, if I can answer this question, yeah. So, so when we are talking uh, about about this part, uh, one of our main main focuses is uh, entrepreneurship. So, in Isam, we're gonna give you uh, the different methodologies used in startups to be able to write your business plan and to be able to validate if that idea makes sense or not. We also have another part uh, related uh, with innovation, where you actually analyze what is happening in the sector. And you have a framework in order to choose what should be, you know, viable or not before going, you know, deep. Uh, we also use the Lean Startup uh, methodology. One of our professors, uh, he's the director from Google Campus, but also he has a background in terms of uh, startups. So he's been working in financing. We are also working with a very, very interesting uh, accelerator uh, that they have a focus uh, in emerging markets that will be involved in terms of like the training of uh, our students. And then, you know, apart from that, uh, we have uh, the expertise uh, within our professors, our contacts, both locally, nationally, and globally. In other, if you're talking about some sectors, uh, you know, to do business, to give you mentorship and to give you advice. So, I mean, for, for us, uh, and also access to, to financing. We're gonna also give you the tools on how uh, you can access financing, how the process works, and um, also be, so you're able to research, depending on the country, you know, what sources you could use. All right, so next one. No, I think it's important to, to mention here, uh, maybe you didn't mention uh, Herman, sure. obviously, but, Herman used to work for 10 years for Holt Business School, one of the famous business schools in the world. That means he also has all of this expertise who he brought to, to ISAM. That means what we want to do, even if this is a kind of a startup, ISAM, but we have all of this accumulated expertise not to accelerate, the, of course, the ISAM process, but at the same time, the people who, who is part of ISAM. Okay. And anyway, Henry, I know you're going to be one of our students next year. One of the things that we want to do, we want to create like a agri-tech competition, uh, international one, uh, that we will do with our students in order to boost entre entrepreneurship. You know, so one of the some of the speakers that you will see in this series are going to be part of the judges and the mentors that will be used in Islam, and they are all global mindset. Okay. So next one. 
uh, from Krisham. So post-COVID, uh, what are the strategies required in food production? For example, in terms of how people's uh, purchasing power uh, will affect demand for food. Of course, uh, Christian, this is going to depend on the market you are really focused on. It's going to depend on the on the segment of the customers you are or consumers you are focused on. This is always the, the first question for me is market and segmentation, no? always. Then we can start to think in pricing uh, and depending if you are a producer and you have to find a customer or you have the market and you have to define what you are going to produce. There are many questions first, Christian, to, to answer this. Clearly, we know that the demand will be affected, but as I mentioned during this, this presentation, uh, consumers are really focused on fresh fruit and vegetables, fresh uh, fish, you know, fresh meat. Um, I think people is value more the quality now. No? I think people also uh, decided or made the decision just to reduce the, the spend expenditure in, in another products, but food, because it's, this is how we build our health, has to be very good. No? Okay, great. So thank you, Christian. Uh, next one uh, from Carolina. So do the consumers go back to their old eating habits and patterns? So, uh, Flavio, you mentioned about oranges and lemons uh, in the United States. Uh, she feels that they will go back to their eating habits and they will just forget about it. So what do you think? My personal view, and again, this may be, of course, have changes depending on the on the country. Meanwhile, I am reading the or your question, Carolina, Im immediately I screen all the different markets based on my experience, blah, blah. Uh, I think for a period of time, people will maintain the, the habit that they are adopting now because they hear that we need to, to improve our health. No, I think we'll continue. And I hope that some of the behaviors come back to the past, especially the, the use of the consumption of plastic. Maybe you, you realize that now there is more plastic again in the supermarket chain due to the COVID, no? And it seems like no, any NGO now is complaining about that. What I expect is that in a couple of months, the situations return and all of us have again, top of the mind, the problem with the plastic, what is amazingly bad, no? Yeah, I mean, uh, building up in what you just said, Flavio, I remember that uh, in the past, the shops they used to sell uh, everything like in, in big quantities. So you will come with your uh, container and fill it in and even Oof. with the water, right? Yeah, Loose product, yeah. Yeah, so even with the water, remember I used to go uh, and get like uh, 20 liters or whatever. And I think I saw in the last year, there were some uh, shops in London, in Madrid, in different places that they were trying to go back to to that uh, way of thinking. So hopefully some people will actually embrace that for sure. I, and I hope the people who study in ISAM really will make it. <laughs> no, it's really what I hope. This is part of, this is why I am really engaged uh, with this idea of ISAM. No, I know what I saw during you know, these 20 years all around the world. And I think that we have the opportunity to change things positively. And always from the viewpoint, if you want of the business, I, it's not maybe a, just a question of being a hippie, no? No, no, from the business view, uh, but let's try to solve issues making business, no? Sure. Okay, uh, thank you, Carolina. So the next one is from Joaquin. So you've talked about consumer in many different countries that behave in the same way. But what do you think about the behavior of countries uh, in terms of food uh, export policies to ensure food security for their own countries? Uh, do you expect some kind of food protectionism? <laughs> it's really a very good question, Joaquin. It's already happening. For instance, uh, India, Cambodia, uh, I think even Thailand, they already uh, ban the export of rice. And this is why, for instance, Nigeria is facing issues with rice because in, I think Nigeria is the first importer of rice in the world, something like that. You know that Nigeria has the largest mm -hmm. population in, in Africa. Uh, clearly, this is affecting. I expect that the WTO play a role. Uh, play a role. I don't know if this is going to happen. Mm. Uh, even internally in Europe, 
there are always some groups that they say, okay, now is the, the time to be protectionist. But when you say that, you are also getting many risks because if you say, okay, I want to avoid others to to export, no, my, my producers to export, I want all the all the product here. But the other country who say, okay, if you do that, I will not buy another product from you. That means it's not just so so simple, just to to establish some kind of protectionism uh, policies, but currently we are seeing some, but not only in food, even in in the pharmaceutical sector, I read uh, an article that most of the raw materials for the medicaments, the antibiotics are coming, of course, from China and India. And in India, they already banned the, the export of 25 of these most important uh, raw materials, something that we every day we are... Wow. We are using the very common that you are buying freely. That means now Europe and other countries are facing a limitation with this raw material. I think it's happening now because there is a kind of term oil due to the, the situation of the COVID. And again, the WTO have to play a role. But clearly and unfortunately, there are some countries with these kind of limitations. Yeah, I think like apart from WTO, uh, also we have Brexit. We have like also what is happening with the US and China. So I think it's going to be very interesting to see what happens in terms of the negotiations uh, with the European Union, UK, UK and the US, because I think it's all linked uh, that way. Yeah. Okay. So next one. Thank you, Joaquin. Uh, next one is from Jose Miguel Flavian. So uh, do you think that the crisis is going to get consumers uh, to demand more local products to support local economies? Hello, Jose Miguel. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, yes, basically, I think I have mentioned it before. I think there is also some part of the societies that have this view. No, this is why, and you know perfectly, this is what happened in, in UK when you have I don't know potatoes with the flag of England. You know, and France happened the same, maybe with apples. These kind of things. And there is a segment of the societies that really value the, these kind of things. But I think, and I also, I am seeing some movement, movements in that direction. You know? I mentioned, I don't know if you listen, Jose Miguel, one example that's happening now in London. No? They are building a 30 yeah. hectares of greenhouses, heating uh, just to replace 10% of the consumption of tomato that normally is coming from south of Spain. That means clearly there will be a more local but of course, all the sustainability side will have to take, uh, have to be taken into account, and I think will be taken into account. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Jose. So the next one from Gerardo. Uh, so, how much do you think uh, the big retailers are responsible on sustainability on the business from a from a grower point of view? For instance, in the fresh industry. I think they have a huge responsibility, you know, uh, has, has a huge, huge responsibility, and especially what I mentioned even before, no? Uh, again, thinking in farmers from all around the world, you know, from India and US, and when you talk about farmers, we also have to make a segmentation. What I said at the beginning, you know, maybe we said farmer, but you have this variety, huge farmers in US, huge farmers in Brazil, but you have producers in Kenya who are producing beans and they have less than half hectare, no? That means this is the first uh, maybe highlight that I like to, to do. Clearly, the buyers have this role to create this incentive to allow the farmers to survive, to pay, you know, everything what they have to pay and to make a benefit for them to, to believe. Clearly, they have... Of course, everybody is responsible for their own behavior. Farmer has, you know, intrinsic responsibilities due to the activity. But I think the whole, no, not only you, you mentioned, I think, uh, uh, retailers, but I think the food industry, you know, when I include Coca-Cola, Pepsi, all of this, they are also responsible to create this and not just to only to blame the production sector to do something. Okay, so next one. Thank you, Gerardo. Uh, from Sergio Martinez from Mexico. So in Mexico, uh, they are facing many problems because their main focus is to export to the USA, but the demand has decreased uh, quite a lot. 
So they're also learning a lot about the situation because they understand that they cannot depend only in one uh, customer and they need to start new st strategies, diversify, right? So what would you recommend to us in order to create uh, new opportunities? Of course, Sergio, it's not an easy, an easy way or an easy answer. We need to make an analysis, think which product you are talking about. Again, I am not saying that they have the right or I am not saying that I have the right answer. I'm saying how I would approach this, no? First, we should think in what is the, the product, how you are packaging this, uh, if this, what is the shelf life of the product you have? Because before telling you what would be the opportunities, I need to understand if the shelf life will be enough to arrive, I don't know, Singapore, for instance. And you telling me this, okay, there is just in the checklist something that we already covered. Depending of many, many factors, but what I saw is there are plenty of opportunities all over the world. We need also the support of our governments because maybe you have the right product, but your government never developed or they have or arrived to an agreement with some country and you are not really able to, to sell. Something that, for instance, you are from Mexico, something that the Chileans did very well. No? The, the government of Chile, for instance, for years, sorry, were developed this uh, free trade uh, arrangement with the government, with the governments, and for instance, in China, on in China, they sell a lot in a very, you know, uh, free way. That means also the governments need to play a role. But for sure, there is a plenty of opportunities. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. I mean, in Isam, we will also teach you how to find those opportunities. I mean, I'm talking every single day with candidates. And one of the main reasons they, they want to come to Isam is to learn how we've done it in Almeria, where we work uh, in, with Europe, with the uh, with the americas and with all around the world you know we export our products and um, it's a way to think how to diversify their offering you know and to find new 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 ways and new ideas okay so the next one thank you sergio is from satish kumar so how the governments especially uh, the african countries will be able to meet their full supplies in the context of covid pandemic of course, we are talking about public sector. There are huge differences between or among all of them. If I have to uh, advise something to the government, I would say have contacts at governmental level and ask this governmental level to reach the biggest traders or producers. Especially, this is very relevant when we talk about commodities, no? The soybean, rice. This is the, normally, they are the best, the basic food for, for the people especially in Africa and, and in Asia. No, this is what I, I would recommend in order to avoid situations uh, similar to what I mentioned regarding the rice no? and the ban to export rice from Cambodia, India, and Thailand. No? But basically, I would recommend let's try to have an open conversation at governmental level. Very good. Thank you, Satish. So the next one is from Jorge del Castillo. So. Do you think that COVID uh, crisis, which has shaken the planet, should be a wake-up call for the agro sector to take radical measures to, com to combat global and climate, climate change? Uh, Jorge, really what I expect is that this COVID brings a kind of radical measures, but not only in, you know, in the agri sector, also in the agri sector, but globally, and again, I invite you to, and I think you already did it, I think you already commented on this uh, article that I call sustainability marketing. Yeah. What I'm saying is, look, we need to be responsible, we need to incorporate sustainability, because on the other hand, we have the consumer who is not just a consumer, he's also a citizen. And when he is making the, the buying choice, he is also making a kind of verdict, you know, saying, okay, this is good and this is not good. That means I hope this is a wake-up call for, for everybody, not just only this sector. I really expect that the agri-sector really get this, this message. And again, maybe from ISAM we can collaborate in this. Okay, great, thank you, Jorge. So the next, next one is from Chris uh, Mujankindi. Uh, so what do you think developing countries or uh, investors should do to mitigate further consequences of coronavirus on food security 
since the market of vegetables and fruits is mainly composed of many small uh, local, uh, you know, non non proper markets. Informal markets. This happened, of course, in maybe you, you are saying this because you are, I don't know, living in Indonesia or in, in Africa. He is, he is from Rwanda. Okay. I think, actually, yeah. Okay, Rwanda. So yes, this, uh, I visited some of countries in Africa. I saw this and also had conversations just to give ideas how we can improve the situation. I think one of the most difficult cases where I, I saw is when I visited Bangladesh, for instance. I did a, an analysis of the whole supply chain of fruit and vegetables specifically. Uh, and so I am talking personally because I did by myself this travel there, talk to every player uh, because it was part of the capacity building project with one of the big donors globally. And really, we did this analysis and we gave some recommendations how you need first to develop the capacity. Really, people need to understand, to make differentiations, to improve how they are producing food, to understand the risk, what they are, how they are producing food. Also, you need to help them to understand the quality because it's not just make a product, any product, uh, without taking into account the, the quality because it's not, never the market will accept this. Mm -hmm. First, you have to develop this uh, farmer's level when you arrive to some level of qualifications, you can also uh, explain how group of producers can work together and also invite the buying sector to say, okay, look, this group of producers have qualified, they are working much better. Could you be interested to be linked with them? I mean, there is a, a work to do. I think it's totally feasible when people is really willing to do, totally feasible. Because again, this is something that we can help uh, uh, from ISAM. Oism, we have all the knowledge from all over the world, and especially from Almeria. Almeria is, is Europe, but it's really it's not really developed the, the agriculture, comparing with maybe Israel or Netherlands, that they are very, very high technology. I think what the experience here also would help all of those countries. I think that we, we have some insights to share with you that could help to develop your, your markets. I am really happy I can be involved somehow. Happy to do that. Thank you. So next one, uh, Megan is now clarifying the question from before. Yes. So, so uh, do you see the effect of food insecurity on the most vulnerable to be greatest, either between countries, for example, USA and South Africa, or within one country, between poor and rich? It's a very good question, Megan. It's a very good question, and really. I don't have any, an easy answer for this, no? I should really analyze. But what we are just reading is always, you know, in this kind of crisis, the rich are richer, you know, and the poor and poorer, no? This is, this is the only thing that I can tell you easily. Uh, I would need to, to think more in details about this and see example, no? Sorry, Megan, I can answer more in, in detail, but this, I don't have, uh, I didn't analyze this previously. No? Yeah, I think, uh, Flavio, this will depend yeah. on each country, you know, because uh, certain countries, depending on the level of support that they have for the poor people, uh, we are seeing like, even in countries like Spain, there's people that they don't have, you know, they, they like, charities have to step in to give food and you will, you will not think about that. So it really depends on, on every country, case by case. Yes, could be one answer, yeah. Sure. So next one uh, from Moselle. Um, oops, sorry. Yes. So it seems that there is a boom in online shopping for fresh produce because of COVID. Will e-commerce be a sustainable strategy for producers in order to market their fresh produce? I think could be, but they need to develop companies. It's not just you know so simple. And the most difficult is something that even you know, Walmart faced in the past was all the logistics. The distribution is the main pain that they they really face. And this is why, for instance, why Amazon, maybe, you know, they bought or acquired Whole Foods years ago because they were very good selling a product, but to sell food, you need to be very close to the customer. And this is why they acquired Whole Foods because Whole Foods had, in the, I think, more than 400 stores 
and they use each store as a kind of, you know, warehouse and when distribute. That means it's not easy all days, the logistics, and especially the last mile. Maybe you can, you know, bring all the products to the capital of the province, but the last mile and all of these companies who have these services to deliver the packages, they don't have, you know, cool chain in this. That means it's a, a possibility, but it's a huge challenge. I'm not saying it's not feasible, but huge challenge. And it's not just so easy that we are producers. Now let's go to sell to, okay. If we talk about the, the neighbor of this neighborhood of this producer, maybe, but we think in business scale, it's more difficult, especially due to logistics. Thank you, Marcel. So the next one from Nikhil Reddy. So uh, he's planning to study uh, and do a job for two to three years in agri-management industry in Spain, and then wants to start his own business after get, getting his own experience in my native country. Uh, he's from India, actually. So that I will be much aware of the industry. Is my thought process right? You know, like the steps to take. Personally, Nikhil, I think it is, no? Um, maybe it's not the right answer for everybody, but it's basically what I did, no? First, I, tried, I tried in the past just to understand, to learn, to have all the knowledge, because it's when you are approaching a sector or a business without, without all of the information, you have something very, very narrow view, and maybe you are losing a lot of opportunities or you don't know how to solve something. This is why it's so important, huh? of course, it's basically you know, the education. I think if you plan, I don't know, I hope you plan to come to ISA, no? but if you get this level of knowledge, theoretical, practical, no? and you come back to develop something, I think you, you are going to have all the tools that you need to, to become a, a good manager. No? Okay, thank you. Uh, now, the next one, Emilian, um, the meat market is under threat from ASF, now also COVID-19. Uh, we hear about cases among employees in slaughterhouses all over Europe. Do you think that this may at some point uh, destabilize the pig market? I don't, exactly. It's the pig market, the one who it, uh, is affected. I think also the big market yeah, is going to be affected as well due to some European legislation. Maybe you have heard that in in Netherlands, for instance, they already obliged producers to reduce the number of of pigs that they are producing. I mean, there is due to the sustainability issues uh, and so on. I know this is a disease. What you mentioned, you know, ASF is is a disease. I, I think. I was talking recently with the largest uh, producer of pigs in Europe. They are, they are a Danish company with operations in Poland and Ukraine. Maybe you know if you are in this business. And he told me that recently they have to to sacrifice thousands of pigs due to to this disease. That means there is something that could uh, make impact in the in the sector, but I think something that could impact more is this change on the consumer's behavior, no? Again, thinking more in healthy food, maybe people is moving more to the fresh fruit and vegetables and even to the, even to the fish sector more than meat, because always, you know, we are listening that the meat is not so good. Maybe pork is better than the red meat, but I am just connecting this with the change in the behavior, what I think, no? what I'm seeing. Well, uh, thanks, Emilian. I think this is the last question. I mean, I'm, I'm extremely impressed uh, with the quality of the questions. Uh, and uh, I can tell you that everybody, they've stayed for all the questions. I think uh, the questions part is being uh, really great. Uh, all, I mean, I haven't even to take out any question or any comment because everything was perfectly uh, well, uh, well uh, phrased. And, and again, you know, I want to thank uh, Flavio uh, for taking part in this webinar. Uh, for Isan, it's really an honor to have him as part uh, of being a co-founder and being one of our professors and helping us with all the strategy of the, of the company. Uh, I think all of you, you've seen 
what are you going to be getting when you are at exam. I think this exchange of information, knowledge, what is happening, uh, that's what we're what we going to have in class. You know, all those interactions, people from around the world with this knowledge exchanging, I think great ideas are going to happen uh, here. And um, uh, thanks again for, for your time to everybody. I don't know if Flavio you want to say a few words. No, thank you everybody for being connected. I know that there are too many webinars all around the world, you know, and for sure everybody, every webinar has a very good speakers, but I am really happy for having, have shared this with you. Thank you, Herman and, and the team. And I hope to see some of you in the next mm -hmm. years in Nissan. Thank you everybody. Thanks. There will be more webinars coming in the, in the next weeks. Bye. Bye-bye. Thanks.